Thank you for joining Sister Power. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. It's time for change and it's up to us. In a year featuring a presidential election, perhaps the most important one of our lifetime, the murder of Breonna Taylor, the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, former social justice of the Supreme Court and the United States and global pandemic. Sister Power is honored to team up with attorneys Daphne Barbie Wooten, Andre Wooten, and Raya Salter. Aloha and welcome to Sister Power. Aloha. 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 I'm so glad to have you join us, Raya, because you're in New York, am I correct? I am in New York now, yes. Okay, and we're here in Honolulu. But before we get started with all these important things that are going on in the world, each of you, please tell us your legal expertise. Tell us about that. Daphne, we'll start with you. Oh, okay. Well, I am a civil rights attorney practicing in Honolulu, Hawaii. I also have authored um, two books thus far, one on um, African-American attorneys in Hawaii and um, my, of my father, Justice for All, Lloyd A. Barbie, and working on a third, won't tell you the name until it's out. But at any rate, um, my specialty is civil rights. I've been in civil rights since I was a young girl. I did demonstrations in Wisconsin. Um, we did for fair housing. We demonstrated for the Civil Rights Act. Um, and many other things. And as well as in Hawaii, I've been a part of the Black Lives Matters demonstration, which recently happened. And uh, as much litigation as possible to try to make things more fair and equitable. Thank you, Raya. So yes, my name is Raya Salter. Aloha, I'm so glad to be with you. Um, I am an energy and utilities lawyer. Um, I practice climate justice advocacy. I'm based in New York now where I work with the Climate Justice Coalition. Um, I have lived and worked in Hawaii. Actually, I'm wearing my uh, kukiai kahuku shirt. I provided um, frontline support to uh, protesters of the wind turbines last year. Um, so I still um, just love to stay connected to Hawaii and even though I'm based in New York and if it weren't for the pandemic, I'd like to say I'd be going um, back and forth. So yes, my background is in clean energy advocacy. I've worked for big green organizations, um, NRDC and EDF. In Hawaii, I uh, worked for the um, Legislative Reference Bureau, also worked with Hank Rogers on some projects. And yes, now I'm in New York focused on climate justice. Thank you, Andre. Aloha, I'm civil rights attorney Andre Wooten. I also practice personal injury law. I had the good fortune to win a million dollar employment discrimination verdict for a African-American man uh, against the state of Hawaii Department of Education some years ago. And so we do a fair amount of employment discrimination law. We also represented Aaron Torres in a wrongful death case in which the three Honolulu police officers uh, answered his 911 distress call and uh, as a prerequisite of taking him to the hospital for observation, uh, they um, insisted upon handcuffing him, which he uh, did not want to do. And they handcuffed him, shackled him, sat on him until he stopped moving and uh, asphyxiated and died. So we are engaged in personal injury suits, police brutality suits, and employment discrimination cases. All right, well, thank you. Well, viewers, get ready for a wild ride. We're going to cover as much as we can. And let's start with, let's jump right into it. Kentucky Attorney General didn't give grand jury option to consider murder charges in Brianna Taylor's case. What was your reaction when you heard about this, Raya? I want to, I mean, clearly be, this has been so difficult. It has inflamed so many. Um, it has kept, the momentum has been overflowing, certainly, um, here in New York. I will defer to my um, 
to my co uh, co panelists who I think have more specific expertise in this area. But I will definitely say that the one thing that obviously it's terrible and it just what happened, but it seemed like when Black Lives Matter was so big that everybody was into it and that a lot of the folks were just gonna move on and, and whoever wants to move on can move on, but we are not moving on. So that is what we are not moving on and that's palpable. So, but I'll, I defer to my co-panelists who are more expertise in this specific area. All right, Daphne, give us your take. Well, I figured that the attorney general didn't provide them with the proper charges. It just makes no sense that they're gonna charge one police officer for shooting at the neighbor's wall, uh, the white neighbor's wall. And so I figured the charge, they did not bring any charges against the police officer who shot Brianna Taylor in the bed several times, killed her, shot her, didn't even call for medical assistance till it was too late. Um, that had to be a situation where the prosecutor, and in this case, it was admitted that they didn't even present any charges against the officers for the killing of Brianna Taylor. Um, people don't understand, but in order to get a grand jury charge, you simply have to present the charge and the name of the suspect or the person you're gonna charge against and several charges. It could be murder, murder one, murder two, manslaughter, reckless. But um, if you don't present those charges against these um, accused, then the grand jury is not gonna go willy nilly and decide to um, give back charges. So that's how the prosecution works. And that's a scary part of our justice system is you prosecutors can choose who to go ahead and um, present a charge against and who not to. And in this case, the Kentucky Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General decided they were not gonna charge the um, police officers who killed her and who did not call for medical help before she died. One well, curious know, thing. Andre, I was gonna ask you, I want you to elaborate on that, but I just saw today where Judge Greg Mathis, he said, get rid of the secret grand juries. Explain that to us also. One curious thing is one of the grand jury members um, has called for the release of the grand jury transcript. Um, he's taken the exception that Cameron is trying to run for cover behind the grand jury and not coming up with a murder indictment against any of the officers. Whereas the person in the grand jury said that, that no murder charges were ever presented against any of the officers. And consequently, um, they followed the prosecutor's instructions and indicted the officer for reckless endangerment that they recommended, but no murder charges were actually presented for the homicide of Bri Brianna Taylor. Now, at the same time, a $12 million settlement has been reached with the city. And in that settlement, there are some recommendations for improvement in the uh, no-knock warrant uh, process, I believe the elimination of the no-knock warrant process, and other uh, reforms of uh, police conduct. But it certainly seemed to me that the officer who created that warrant based upon false and negligent information uh, when the person for whom they were serving the warrant was actually in jail at the time they kicked in Brianna Taylor's door, it seemed to me that that uh, warrant was uh, totally defective and uh, there should have been some charges about that. Because yeah. that justified their entry into the home and then the prosecutor was saying it was justified for them to uh, engage in self-defense but if their entry into the home was illegal uh, which he didn't seem to want to push um, then their argument of self-defense was also illegal and they should have been charged with homicide or Brianna Taylor who fired no shots. Well we're still waiting for justice for Brianna but let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, it took eight days for U.S. President Donald Trump to nominate Seventh Circuit Judge Amy Barrett to take the still warm seat of the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. Daphne, tell us your thoughts. You had the opportunity to meet the notorious RBG. Yes, I did. She came to Hawaii several times to teach at the UH Law School. And she also uh, presented a speech at the Hawaii um, 
state Supreme Court, which Andre and I attended. Um, you know, it's really wonderful to see an 85, she was 85 at the time, an 85 year young uh, justice to talk for half an hour without any notes, um, to speak eloquently and to talk about justice. Um, and then afterwards, she graciously met anyone who was there who wanted to meet her. They sat her in a chair. She had her white gloves on and her pearls. <laughs> and uh, she met with anybody who came by to talk. Uh, she was very rational, clear of mind. She was frail, but strong in her thoughts. And so I had that fortune. I actually had photos, but unfortunately my cell phone isn't working really well. Otherwise I'd have them presented to you. But she took time to nurture other uh, attorneys and especially women attorneys, because she was the first, she was the uh, one of the first women attorneys. She was number two um, to take the Supreme Court seat. And she uh, authored many a good um, decision. For example, she was the one who wrote about VMI, which was a school which only um, allowed men, uh, young men into it. It was a college. And she said that was sex discrimination because women could not go. Similar to Brown versus Board of Education, which was segregated by race. And then um, Justice Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court changed that by saying, uh, changing the law saying you can't have segregated schools that are paid through federal funds. And the same with the VMI college was paid through federal funds. So therefore it couldn't discriminate against women. So she, in addition to dissenting to many of the horrible opinions such as the Voting Rights Act decision, which threw out part of the Voting Rights Act, she um, also authored many good opinions. Brian, your thoughts? Uh, I, it's important how uh, Daphne mentioned Thurgood Marshall. To, to me, this really is a similar situation where when Thurgood Marshall was replaced by Clarence Thomas, now we have somebody who opened the keys for women attorneys and women, and now this woman is going to walk through that door to shut them, <laughs> to shut that door. Um, and it's unfortunate. Um, so that just in terms of you know, and, and again, as a woman, you get this, you know, and I, I understand she has her beliefs and people say, isn't it, I'm just, I'm just going to say how I'm feeling about it. it. You know, isn't it so amazing that she made the choice to have her child who had Down syndrome, even though she know, knew he had Down syndrome. That's the very choice that she had, that she, that this court leaning this way to get away from her personally, even though there is an indignity of how her, of, of her replacing Justice Ginsburg, who wasn't perfect, but who was a lot. Um, what is at stake with the court, voting rights, um, women's reproductive health, health care more broadly. She's, we've heard she's been critical of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so, I mean, a lot is at stake with this court that is going to lurch to the right because of this choice. Yeah. Well, you know, Andre, today we are reminded of the hurdles overcome by heroic women who face women's, who face violence and discrimination to propel the women's movement forward. What are your reactions to um, number 45 before the seat is just very warm, suggesting that um, Amy, a uh, nominating her, that she should come in. Tell us your thoughts. Basically, this is all politics. And Mitch McConnell and the Republicans played politics in the last year of um, Barack Obama's presidency and refused to nominate uh, or even entertain um, Merrick Garner for uh, the Supreme Court. And consequently, I do believe the Democrats should play hardball with this one. They should filibuster it um, because the balance of the court is extremely important. And uh, you can't forget the fact that Trump was not elected by the majority. He was elected by the electoral college that put a person who got the minority of votes into office. And so having the Republicans stack the Supreme Court when they are only representing a majority is an anathema to democracy. And I, for one, uh, recommend if they put this woman on the Supreme Court, they should have two more justices to the court. 
There's no constitutional limit to the number of Supreme Court justices on the court. And uh, the Democrats should play hardball if the Republicans do. With regard to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was basically a justice that stood up for democracy and fairness. Um, in particular, the case of Citizens United. The Citizens United case had to do with uh, the, ultimately the holding was you can have all the democracy you can afford to buy. And uh, she thought that that was uh, totally contrary to the American Constitution, at least the way it should be, and any real concept of justice. And so uh, the cases involving Citizens United and the cases involving uh, voting rights that she stood up for uh, were on the right side of history. And I do believe that she will ultimately be vindicated on those. Okay, well, we're 33 days out before the election. Uh, and I'm sure that most of us watched the first presidential debate. And what I like, I like what um, uh, our forever first lady, Michelle Obama said afterwards. If you were turned off by the president's behavior last night, I feel you. Believe me, I do. But we can't let him win by turning out altogether. Tuning out, he means to turn, tuning out altogether. That's what he wants. That's what 45 wants. So turn those feelings into action, meaning vote, people, we must vote. So let's talk briefly about the first presidential debate. Um, and the most outstanding one, I'd love what Van Jones had to say that the president of the United States did not, did not say he was, for, for, was not for white supremacy. So let's start there. What are your thoughts about that, Daphne, about the presidential um, debate? Well, I, I was not surprised that Donald Trump did not um, condemn white supremacy because he is a white supremacist. And frankly, we always knew that when he was running for presidency, um, he would all cater to um, whites who felt they were superior. He felt he was superior. What did he say about African and brown nations? He called them S-hole countries. Um, he called Mexicans rapists. Um, he, he said he preferred immigrants from Norway and Sweden as opposed to the S-hole countries. Uh, the way he treated um, other dignitaries and presidents was a, a clear illustration of his belief that whites were uh, superior to non-whites. So I was not surprised when he said he wouldn't condemn KKK or the Proud Boys. And if you recall, he was even asked the question about David Duke and the KKK uh, back when he was running in 2016. And he said he didn't know who David Duke was. He couldn't condemn David Duke and the KKK when they found photos of him with the David Duke and the KKK before he ran for election, um, you know, holding hands basically, you know, uh, hands on the shoulder, grinning and grinning. Um, but he's always been a racist. Um, he's always looked down upon other people and even against women. He's always been against women, the way he treats women and talks about women. So it's not just racist, it's also sexist. So it's no surprise. I mean, look what he did with Hillary Clinton when he stalked her at the last um, uh, uh, last time he debated it for the presidency. And I, I couldn't believe they let him get away with that. And he was just walking behind her, breathing on her neck. Um, and he didn't do that, at least with Biden. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, stand back, stand by. I didn't mean, I've never heard of the Proud Boys, but I have a question for you, Andre, and then you can also elaborate. I, I was reading somewhere, and I want your advice to the listeners out there. It's no secret many Black men are not interested in voting this cycle. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to convince these men their vote is essential to our people? The power and the magnitude and the necessity to vote uh, really 
um, has always been obvious to me, but then again, I was, you know, raised in a house with a politician. My father, uh, Charles Stokes, was uh, a representative of our neighborhood in the Washington State Legislature. And um, he was also elected uh, to a judgeship in Seattle. And uh, so uh, people really need to participate. Um, if you participate, uh, you can have a voice, uh, even if you're in a minority, uh, if you coalesce and make partnerships with groups that have common interests with yours, then you can leverage your numbers and your power and, and get some things accomplished. Um, basically, that's what we had to do to get the Martin Luther King holiday passed into law here in Hawaii is convince the other community groups that human rights was a necessity for them as well, not just the black people. The black people were symbolic, but the question was, what side of justice are you on? Um, and so we're in a similar case here. Um, are you going to sit on your butt while Trump uh, becomes Hitler or Mussolini? Or are you going to do whatever you can to get up and vote? Yeah. We just got back from Seattle. And one thing I like seeing on the businesses and stuff were signs saying, vote early. Vote early and vote early. I'm not going to say vote twice or three times, but vote early. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> absolutely. And also, viewers, go to IWillVote.com to register and make a plan to vote. And make sure everybody around you is doing the exact same thing. And I want to remind Hawaii voters can also vote before Election Day, the early voting period runs from Tuesday, October 20th, 2020 to Monday, November 2nd, 2020. So absolutely vote, 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 vote. And what I also enjoy that the athletes have um, often been major voices for equality and social justice. And LeBron James, after the, they won the game, he announced that his initiative to increase the number of poll workers in Black Ethereal District had amassed 10,000 volunteers since it began. Isn't that wonderful? So tell me it more is. about uh, Raya. What else can people do to utilize their platforms? Yes, we're here in a pandemic. We've lost over uh, 200,000 deaths are here in the US. We're locked at home. Let's encourage people, Raya, and then you, Daphne, how people can use their platform to vote. I think this is a great question and really important because Trump is walking the beast of racism and fear and oppression. And, and so much of it is to create this, it's almost to get in our minds and make, and, and make us feel that he can't be defeated. He's, it's, he's gonna steal it, he's gonna cause violence. And he, he that is, we still have the power. That is not true. That type of poll watching effort that you talked about Mr. Um, Mr. James putting forward is exactly the type of stuff that we can do in our own communities to counter that. And now in this virtual world, as much as we're at home and it's very hard, we can connect on stuff like Zoom. There are local groups. There are so many ways to jump in and get active. I, I know I've done phone banking writing postcards, calling into Miami to say, hey, are you going to be with us? And it's, you know, it's also, it's exciting each other, the Democrats, it's getting, getting a vote out. There are so many opportunities to do that from home. And I definitely, we need to not be afraid. We need to listen to Ms. Ms. Obama, Mrs. Obama, exactly what you read and, and not let him be in our minds because we can take this fool down. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Take the clown down. <laughs> um, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, there's a lot of things people can do to get involved, um, especially in swing states. You send postcards from Hawaii urging people to vote, make phone calls urging undecided voters, write letters to the editor, write letters to anybody, <laughs> and just say, hey, we don't understand why you're undecided. I remember watching Trevor Noah the other night, and he goes, you're undecided, why? <laughs> you know? So uh, 
write to the undecided and explain why you shouldn't sit on the fence on this particular election. Because as Andre says, we don't want to end up a, a Nazi country or we don't want to end up a country where white supremacy takes us way back to before Brown versus Board of Education. And we are the majority now in America. The majority are not white. Americans are not white. We have uh, pieces of blood from all over the world. And so we can take it, we can vote and um, encourage others to vote. You can, if you're in a state where people need to have rides to the poll, donate your vehicle to give rides to people to go to the poll and back home, especially for the elderly. In Hawaii, we just have mail-in. Okay. About, so, the, okay. about that uh, debate, I mean, I've seen a lot of Republican commentators who were just totally turned off by Trump's performance, ignoring the rules and being totally rude and um, saying statements about white supremacy. And so um, I think the consensus is that the debate was a disaster for Trump, even among Republicans. Now he might've reached out to some, some radicals, but the reasonable thinking Republicans, you know, they're voting in the other direction. Yeah, well, you know, we only have a few minutes left. I, I, get, I have to have, we must come back. But racism is the deadliest pandemic of all. In two minutes or less, Raya, Andre, and Daphne, give us a, a, a boost and encouragement and motivator speech as if you were in the courtroom right now for everyone to get out and vote. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> I, it, I think uh, certainly I really want to encourage people. It's so important to vote. We got to take the clown down. And you're just right about racism is certainly something in the climate justice realm. Um, the root causes of these crises and climate change needs to be talked about more in terms of who it impacts black and brown people and places like Hawaii is that the root causes of these problems truly are um, white supremacy, racism, colonialism, what was done to this world. And we need to change that direction. And the only way to really change that trajectory is to show up and vote. Daphne. Okay. Um, remember our ancestors, African-American blood in you, you remember that your ancestors couldn't vote in the 1950s and the constitution didn't allow anybody who wasn't a white man of property to vote. So that change evolved. But just remember our ancestors died. They were lynched, they were shot at, they were maimed simply because they wanted the right to vote. And That's not right. just African-Americans, but white Americans who helped African-Americans and went down during the civil rights 1960s uh, and were murdered, uh, Cheney, Schwerney um, in Mississippi. Um, Fannie Lou Hammer became blind due to a beating, trying to get the right to vote. And then she went on to run for office. So, um, you know, we owe it to our ancestors to maintain this power and this right to vote. And just remember South Africa. Um, remember those lines, miles of lines there to um, vote President Nelson Mandela into office. Um, so let's not just turn away um, and sleep through this vote. Wake up and stay woke. All right, Andre. We are at a pivotal time. We have a president who reads Mein Kampf, who wants uh, major military parades for him when he dodged the draft himself and never served and nobody in his family has ever served. He is talking about not leaving office uh, when uh, he loses the election. <laughs> this is a serious matter. And uh, if you believe in justice, if you believe in democracy, um, you've got to stand up and vote. Um, you know, that's really a minimum. I mean, if you're not going to contribute money, if you're not gonna go uh, demonstrate, um, you can show up and vote even if it's by mail. Thank you, Raya. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Andre. I'm Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Please take care of, your, take care of yourself and each other. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.